one of the reasons my books are short and fast reading is because I'm trying to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and certainly, in any case, I'm, uh, I don't like slow moving things. Sure. If anybody knows me will know. I, I, you know, I, I, I can't sit through a Minal Sen film without fidgeting. <laughs> There's just not something I could possibly what? do. Uh, so, <laughs> so consequently, I write fast, I write in bursts because, because I just have to get it out of my head sometimes. Sure. But I like doing the research. I'm very meticulous and I'm quite painstaking in the research part. Diva Cards Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. This is where we try and go behind the thoughts that animate the actions of those uh, who create the arts. And uh, uh, the wonderful Sanjeev Sanyal with us, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in one of the driving seats of the economic think tank of the uh, of the country. But then uh, sometimes he hops off and starts writing things like um, Life Over Two Beers, which uh, regrettably I do not own, though I have read a little of. <laughs> and uh, also um, one of my personal favorites, uh, The Land of Seven Rivers. What a wonderful, the history of India's geography. I mean, you know, my inner pseudo just jumped out and, and picked the book up because just the name, you don't even need to t turn the pages, just the name itself um, was uh, seductive to say the least. Uh, uh, so how did the process of uh, 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 of being a writer from being an economist, the, the dry numbers turn into uh, uh, the juice of words, when did that happen? Um, let me say that I am, uh, if, if you went back and met any of my uh, school or university teachers, they'd be entirely shocked that I had <laughs> become a writer uh, of any uh, kind because I am really a science maths kind, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. uh, you know the type. Of course, uh, more likely. So then, if, you know, economics is in itself the outer edges of what I would have done. Right. And so yes, I did do a lot of writing as part of as an economist. That's part of what you do. Of course. But very different kind of things. So it's only really in the in my thirties. That's about you know uh, it. So that's. Uh, some more than a little less than 20 years ago, uh, I then began to uh, really look at uh, writing about various things. So right. originally, I actually wrote a bunch of random short short stories, mm -hmm. uh, which nobody wanted to publish. <laughs> so, okay. so, um, so when I took this to Penguin, they said, "Yeah, short stories, yeah, whatever." But you know, you are a reasonably well-known economist. Why did you write this other book? So that's how I ended up writing my first book, which is called "The Indian Renaissance." Of course. Uh, of and course. so that wrote that. And since that sort of sold a little bit, so they said, okay, we'll probably publish something else we write, but don't get those short stories back. <laughs> um, write something else. Now, it happened to be at that point in time, I decided to take time out. Okay. And, uh, I, you know, I've worked in financial markets internationally, but I moved back to India for a couple of years with my kids because I, they had essentially grown up abroad. And I wanted to take them for a generally a drive around India. Right. So as a part of that, I drove around all over India. And um, the um, Land of Seven Rivers is a result of those travels. If you, if you read the dedication, they're yes. dedicated to my sons. Absolutely. And so that's basically what it, what, how I got into writing. It's not, not some plan, not something anybody, anybody would think I, I, I was going to do. But, but, but an astounding example of uh, how to take the leap of faith. <laughs> you literally let go of a, a, a nation's head of banking, so to speak, for a, for a private bank. And, and you took the leap according to Wikipedia. And uh, of course, there's also other secondary sources of research that, uh, that bear uh, this fact out that you literally let go of a job to do the research yeah. for your book. Um, was that a leap of faith or was that a considered decision as far as the e economy of the of the home was concerned uh, let me put it this way uh, it was uh, not planned in fact it came entirely as a surprise even to my wife <laughs> okay. um, so I one fine morning at some point in the year 20 I think it's uh, t t sorry 2008 I just got up one morning and resigned from my job uh, <laughs> and then phoned my wife and informed her that I had done so and that we were basically moving back to India and going around driving for two years uh, so I gave some months of uh, lead way to my uh, employer. Right. So end of uh, 2008, beginning 2009, I moved to uh, Gurgaon actually. And um, my, my employer, Deutsche Bank, uh, kept me on as some sort of a consultant because they wanted me to continue. So I didn't entirely cut off my link. Sure. But yes, I was basically 
uh, footloose and frenzy free in Gurgaon, a city I'd never lived in before, right. uh, with a somewhat uh, annoyed uh, wife and two small kids who didn't know what, what the hell was going on. But then we had a great time for two years. Sure. We drove around all over India. Uh, I sort of dug up a lot of stuff mm -hmm. um, that ended up in that book that you mentioned, Land of Seven Rivers. It's it's absolutely incredible to see that uh, lived experiences and research can go so beautifully hand in hand. So it was literally driving down, uh, getting your research done, and driving down to another place. Was it that? Was that your uh, process? No. So the, so the so the book is the result of the travels. I was not planning to write a book in the beginning. Ah. So after a while, I said, hey, well, if I'm doing this, maybe it's interesting to other people. And then I began collecting other material and so on. So it's not the case that I said, oh, I'm writing a book and I'm leaving a job. It's sure. more like, yeah, what the hell? Why don't we just do this and then see what happens? And then book comes out of it. And it's, of course, a, a fantastically well-researched book. So um, uh, how much of, of pain was there as far as the primary resources and the, and the secondary research and sitting down and um, uh, poking your eyes into those words is concerned? How, how difficult or easy was that? So let me say that I'm one of those writers who actually doesn't particularly like writing. Um, <laughs> okay. I like the research part because I find all this stuff interesting. Right. And having done that, I kind of feel I am obligated to somehow put it on print or something like that. So... Um, Again, that one of the reasons my books are short and fast reading is because I'm trying to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and certainly, in any case, I'm, uh, I don't like slow moving things. Sure. If anybody knows me will know. I, I, you know, I, I, I can't sit through a Minal Sen film without fidgeting. <laughs> There's just not something I could possibly what? do. Uh, so, <laughs> so consequently, I write fast. I write in bursts because, because I just have to get it out of my head sometimes. Sure. But I like doing the research. I'm very meticulous and I'm quite painstaking in the research part. There's also this thing about when I was reading this book, um, frequently my inner pseudo would be so happy because there were these little nuggets that would be thrown in where I could almost sense you read that and say, wow, this is trivia that people can flaunt. So <laughs> I'd really like to know about that little, those little bits of trivia that you've so beautifully woven into the narrative of the, the so the stuff that I found interesting. So I put it in there because I figured other people find it interesting. It turns out they did. So, and, and then of course there's the ocean in churn as well, um, uh, which is, it seems to have uh, uh, become a bit of an addiction, is it? <laughs> The, uh, so, the, natural so, the, the natural geography of the country. Yeah, so the, that uh, Land of Seven Rivers, for whatever reason, became a super bestseller. Sure. So, some point... Lovely in, humble brag yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, it became I know, not something that I, I, I had expected. It just sure. became one. Meanwhile, however, I had kind of got bored of being retired. Mm -hmm. So, I went back to Deutsche Bank and became the uh, global strategist. Uh, but I didn't want to live in Frankfurt, so I negotiated to go back to live in Singapore where I had lived earlier anyway. Right. So I lived in Singapore, I traveled a hell of a lot. But s since I lived in Singapore, one of the things that strikes you is that it's named Singapore, uh, which is obviously an Indian name, Singapura. Sure. Um, and there's a country right next door named after India called Indonesia. Mm. And they have a currency called the rupiah. And their national symbol is the Garuda. Of course. Um, and so you begin to say that there must be something to this. Um, uh, and of course, um, when we are taught history in India, we are taught this very um, landlocked history, uh, much of it from the perspective of Delhi. Sure. Whereas if you live in Southeast Asia, it's obvious that there is Indian influence everywhere. So I sure. began to dig this um, while working. Again, um, I went to, off to Cambodia, um, to Kangkor Wat, I went all over uh, Indonesia, I went all over Vietnam, uh, and so on and so forth. And then once again, a book began. At this time, it was a little more deliberate, I must admit. Sure. Um, so by this time, I was beginning to see, hey, this could also be a book. And so then I deliberately went and visited places that may be a part. So for example, I drove along the west co coast of India and up the east coast of India. I went to Oman, Zanzibar, and so on. So at that stage, I was researching it uh, more. So that's the outcome of a slightly more systematic sure. approach to research. And of course, your love for landscape also gets a little figurative yes. because you're now very actively part of uh, mapping India's economic landscape as well. Um, uh, a book there in the world somewhere? Um, uh, a nice, uh, sexy little take on uh, on economics? So, uh, the, the, the point is, all of you read my economics writings all the time. <laughs> it's called the Economic it is Survey. It is the true. last five economic <laughs> surveys were um, uh, written by um, me partly and edited by me 
Uh, the last one in 22 was signed by me. A little bit dry, if you'll forgive me. <laughs> Maybe dry, but I tried to zip it up. I mean, um, I, I, have, I am hoping that uh, some of you will agree that dry as it may be, the genre may be, I have, I have zipped it up a little bit. So there, there's last year's economic survey uh, had an entire chapter on satellite maps. Mm. I don't know if you saw that. So it is all, so you, if you're interested, you know, Nighttime luminosity and all those kinds of things. So I, of I brought in some interesting things. Hopefully, yes. Uh, let's see what uh, uh, Anant, my dear friend, is going to do this year. But I have now been freed from that, so hence I'm here. I, that's why I couldn't come to the last few um, JLFs because I I was in there typing away at the economic <laughs> survey. So uh, to answer your question, um, so you have been reading my economics writings other so, than my articles, but a lot of it is not in my name. So of course, it comes under the government of India's name. But um, um, so, uh, uh, and of course, write working papers and stuff now for the sure. uh, Prime Minister's Economic Council as well. But a book, uh, yes, I am thinking of putting together a book uh, over time. I, it, uh, it's there in my head. Um, it will probably be related to complexity theory, which uh, pops up in almost all my writings, whether it's on history or urban design. Um, and, and a lot of my, a lot of economic policy making done in the recent sure. years is derived from complexity theory, um, which I explicitly say so. But maybe there may is a case for writing a book and explaining what on earth it is. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, that that sounds uh, very very uh, um, uh, needed, so to speak, <laughs> because those terms can get very intimidating. And your writing, of course, is uh, accessible uh, to use a very accessible word. Uh, but of course, from uh, uh, the lava flowing down mountains, you've actually now graduated to the lava of human emotion with a uh, with a new book. It's uh, um, uh, it's about revolutionaries. Yes, um, uh, you want to tell us a little about that. So yes, so this uh, book is called the Revolutionaries. Uh, the, the subtitle explains it all. The other history of how India won its uh, freedom. Mm -hmm. So um, this book is about the armed resistance to British colonial uh, occupation of India. Uh, of course, the the the, the, re the thing that I'm responding to is the narrative is that somehow India's freedom struggle was very peaceful, um, and that you know we 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 gently suggested to the British that they should leave and they very politely left. And yes, there were these sporadic chaps called Bhagat Singh and Raj Bihari or whatever, who may have been somewhat inconveniently, you know, uh, uh, doing some revolutionary type things. Uh, but they were a side story and didn't add up to much. That is basically the, the narrative that is the mainstream narrative. So I, in this book, I've challenged this and suggested that, look, um, this was not a small movement. Many of these people uh, there were tens of thousands of people involved in this movement. Uh, they, they, it was a systematic movement with clear objectives and, uh, and organization. Um, they were uh, not only networked inside India, they, were net they had embassies in places like Berlin in the First World War. They had networks in North America, they had networks in Japan. And so, uh, you know, uh, th there was nearly a full-scale revolt in the British Indian Army in the First World War, um, the Gadarite Revolt, which didn't succeed. But it, it was nearly happened. Sure. And there were many other such incidents. There's also this uh, thing about, uh, you know, as you said, uh, you've written the alternate uh, uh, history in that, the other history in that well. Said, uh, uh, you know, um, there's, uh, there's a word that's been increasingly used uh, as far as uh, history and its interpretations are concerned, in especially the current scenario, which is weaponization. Um, uh, which is perspective, which is the fact that uh, is being looked at from one angle and the other angle is being, um, uh, you know, is being increasingly, uh, the blacks and whites are actually leading to um, uh, the ignoring of the greys and the, and the nuances of history. What are your views on that? So, um, let's take this particular uh, instance of the freedom struggle. Right. Uh, there is no doubt that we have got a very skewed view of our freedom struggle. Just go and look at the narrative you would have heard. Bina Khadak, Bina Adhal, you know, that kind of narrative. Uh, yes, you have, you know, the occasional uh, member. Sorry. But I have a point. I'm sorry. Yeah, but, okay. but, you know, people like Chandrasekhar Azad are, are icons, actually. We've yes, but, but it's very important how they remember. You know, you get the impression that these are sporadic acts of individual bravery mm -hmm. that didn't have any impact on the story. So, that is not wrong. Uh, that is completely not true. So, when you see it from the perspective of the revolutionaries, there is a sustained effort with sustained impact. And in fact, they would argue that um, this, uh, this, this whole effort culminating in first the INA, 
the INA trials and of course the great naval revolt of 1946 sure. is the uh, sort of the sort of chain of events that leads to freedom um, and that um, you know the other I'm not saying that the salt march didn't have any impact mm. that that movement also has an impact but if you ignore this lineage uh, uh, then what you're giving is a very partial story there's also not, so okay uh, uh, to give a, a, a question that's uh, uh, you know uh, in my pop, popping in my head right now which is that none of the names that you're saying are sporadic are are, are unknown to um, uh, to no. anyone i mean if you were to mention a chandrasekhar azad or a bhagat singh or a rajguru or a rajbihari bose even uh, subhash chandra bose is of course and, and remains in a national icon yeah. my point being uh, that uh, what is there a parameter for the sporadicity that you talk about no so this is the point i'm trying to tell they are not sporadic at all right it's not like bhagat singh gets up one morning and decides oh it's a great day to go and throw a bomb in uh, the central assembly no there is a clear uh, pattern to it they have they are agitating against certain kinds of things in a particular pattern so sure. and so that you get some sense of it um there is a gentleman called sachindranath sanyal yes he forms an association in 1923 or 24 and he calls the hindustan republican association now why is this an interesting thing because he writes a constitution for it and in that constitution he says we are going to make india after it become firstly he asks for full freedom and then he says we are after freedom we're going to become a democratic republic with universal suffrage now let me tell you why the statement is so important at this point in time the congress party is still not demanding full freedom they are asking for dominion status mm -hmm. even those who want purna swaraj i full freedom have not articulated what is it that they want after independence so this is it is the revolutionaries that said we would be democratic mm -hmm. we would be a republic and that it would be based on universal suffrage remember at this point in time in 1923 uh, 24 uh, even in britain the women did not have the vote and much of the world uh, was not universal suffrage even if it was a democracy so the <coughs> the 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 revolutionaries had a clear view of what they were doing they had organizations uh, at various points in time they had embassies in other countries uh, but are you also saying that uh, they were uh, all of these things uh, uh, that you're saying the constitution of course uh, you know uh, we are all very very familiar with what uh, uh, subhash chandra bose uh, yes. wanted for india as a nation uh, it's very much out there in public in the public domain in public discussions as well uh, were you are you saying that all of these at that point of time in in history were being ignored or were they not being incorporated no. i mean so what is i'm just trying to uh, huh. i'm just trying to un understand the sporadicity angle uh, yeah. of it so as i said <clears throat> these events are not in ancient events these exactly. are within living memory in some cases there's still people alive who participated in these events and well documented and well documented so sure. so the question is so therefore they have not been wiped out from people's memories because that would not be easy to do what has been done and this is very cleverly done and deliberately done i'm going to and i'm going to show you how was that they were sliced up as sporadic acts of individual heroism that didn't really add up to very much so you're saying that there was an undermining of their role absolutely okay. and it was done deliberately okay and the reason for this is very simple in 1947 what happens is india does become free Uh, to a significant extent because of the efforts of the revolutionaries but their own leadership does not survive till 1947 so um netaji subhash bose is dead or missing depending on your view uh, sachin sanyal is dead raj bihari bose is dead uh, bhagat singh is dead uh, chandrasekhar azad is dead bismil is dead etc etc so none of the key leaders of the revolutionary movement live till independence so what happens is that and incidentally they the, these revolutionaries were very powerful even within the congress so, as as netaji demonstrated course, i mean course. in an open election he could defeat the gandhian so it's not the case that the the, the congress pre independence congress was was one stream it was a big tent now at independence one stream of the the nehruvian stream of the uh, congress captures power now not very surprisingly they overplay their own role which is perfectly human behavior of course but what they do next is not excusable they then clearly wipe out the contributions of other branches of uh, the freedom struggle 
And by the way, there are other branches. I have talked about the revolutionaries, but the revolutionaries, by the way, were linked to other sources of uh, resistance as well. They were closely related to, for example, the tribal revolts. They were closely related to other peasant revolts, such as the Eka movement of Madari Pasi. Now, many of these things will not be known. It's only because of RRR that people have heard of Aluri, Sitarama, Raju. So, See, all of yeah. Of course, the, uh, I understand where this. Uh, I mean, uh, where you're going, and there's yeah. also you know the case of the Birsa Mundas and the uh, and the yeah, yeah. So so there's of course no that. no that is a longer history. I'm talking about just this more recent. Sure. So let me show you how this is done this systematically. Okay. R. C. Majumdar is given the job of writing the official history of India in the 1950s. So he writes a first draft. He was then at that time considered the top historian in the country. And in that draft, he writes a much wider history of how India became free. This is considered in, uh, by the establishment of that time inconvenient. And he's actually removed from the writing, uh, chairmanship of this committee. Mm -hmm. Then there is systematically uh, destruction of all the things that are related to the, uh, uh, the revolutionaries. I'll give you an example. The cellular jail. Today, when you go to the cellular jail, there's only two. Uh, it was actually a radial. Of, only two of those radials have survived. All the others were pulled down. And these two were also supposed to be pulled down. They were saved on the last minute. And that's why they are there as a national uh, memorial. Uh, same thing was down in Maulana Azad uh, College. That was actually a jail, which had actually uh, many, many revolutionaries were hanged there. And that the revolutionaries demanded that it be con con converted into a memorial. Nehru agreed to this. But then after that, that place was torn down and a medical college was deliberately built there. So there is a systematic wiping out of the contributions of the revolutionaries. If you look at the NCRT textbooks that are still there, you will, you will barely see, uh, you know, there's, okay, INA Netaji suddenly turns up from uh, thin air, so, does something and that is the end of the story. So the paintbrush, of course, was political as far as Absolutely. the national... Uh, but, but isn't that a danger now of uh, of doing the same, uh, repeating the same template uh, while doing uh, the opposite side? I mean, there is the thing. Allow me. So to okay, uh, yeah. So, me so let me let me let me. No, no. no I just yeah, want to yeah. say one more thing, which is that unfortunately we are. We, uh, I do. This is a personal notion, mm -hmm. of course. But allow me to say this: that uh, we have forgotten that the opposite of of black is not necessarily white. The opposite of black is anything that is not black. You know, and are we forgetting in this obsession with showing the blacks and the whites, the fact that there is uh, aggression and there is uh, peace and that those uh, could be mutually, uh, uh, those are parallel lines that are running. Are we also running the risk of repeating the mistake uh, of history, which we are doomed to unless we learn from it? So kindly read the book and no point in the book, right in the beginning, I state that this is not a book that states that the Gandhian movement was of no value. It states that it was there, but there is this other story that is not told. So, right in there, I make this clear that I am not attempting to uh, say that the, the other movement had no uh, role to play. Uh, the Congress did have a role to play, even the Gandhian faction of the role and the Nehruvians had a role to play. It's just that the revolutionaries also had a very important role to play and that story needs to be told. So, would I be right in saying that in saying that they did have a role to play, but the other also had a role to play? Uh, is there also, a, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, an insinuation that uh, uh, that there was uh, an overwhelming of one role by that of the other? Is that what no, no, there's no insinuation. Okay. But what there is an insinuation of is that the history subsequently written is one sided. And that is absolutely there's more than adequate evidence of this. And I think there is a need for balancing this. Uh, and since you talked about rewriting history, this is not only about this bit. There is a longer history that needs to be re rewritten. Sure. And I think the textbooks that you can read the NCRT textbooks, they are clearly obviously biased. I'll give you lots of biases. We I mean, why on earth are we all, <coughs> why are we only obsessed with the history of Delhi? I mean, if you're from Odi Odisha, for example, you'll get the impression that your only importance in history is being invaded by Ashoka. Uh, you know, and, and, <laughs> and 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 and. And the Northeast uh, basically does not exist, even though they smashed every uh, army coming from of Delhi uh, 17 times. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the people of uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Assamese, uh, quite correctly, are rather pissed off about this. Of course. And um, 
and you know large parts of southern india is kind of sitting around twiddling till the british come and set up chennai or something the, or madras the fear of course uh, is and that's been enunciated by a lot of people is that um, in trying to um, correct the leaning from one side is there a fear, fear of uh, leaning a little so so let me let me say first of all these textbooks have not been changed no so, i understand so so, so 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 first of all let's agree that it needs to be changed <laughs> to argue that oh if we changed it we will go that too far is an argument uh, and therefore we should retain the status But, quo is that a bullshit no no so no so let me just point this out first of all let's agree it needs to be changed now it is true that there are many interpretations of history and i agree that whatever interpretation of history has to be put in has to bear bear facts bear stick to the facts everybody has everybody has a right to their opinion but they don't have a right to their facts absolutely so the problem with the current textbooks is that they're not true to the facts so let the facts be placed i have no problem with being multi in fact why do we insist on one view of history um you put on television there are differences of opinions of what happened yesterday so why do you expect historians to agree on what happened 1000 years ago let that be but at least I'm, put the facts down right now deliberate misrepresentation of facts by the marxist and nehruvian historians I, no I, i understand i mean i am also a product of the subaltern uh, uh, historian uh, you know yeah. um, narrative that was put out through ncrt etc etc uh, there's also you know the story of of, of an india uh, as seen by the history of india as seen by romila thapar as opposed to one seen by john key um what i'm trying to ask and i'm not saying that uh, 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 that you know uh, one is overwhelm the other i'm just saying that uh, is there enough recognition of the other side in trying to show what the other side exists as well of one side uh, uh, in trying to show that the other side exists is there is that balance a delicate one to keep and yeah, is really, the seduction of the other side uh, a little strong since uh, there's now been a very long period in which one kind of history has been told uh, do not use that to say oh now the other side is going to lie so yes i agree with you uh, uh, get, you know one <laughs> one set of lie one set of lies cannot be replaced by another set of lies uh, i agree with you on that no no but uh, to say that because another set of lies may actually come therefore this set of lies should be perpetuated is ridiculous so let let the new people come up with a set of uh, new textbooks and new narratives let the at least the fact of the matter is a decade ago you would not have had even this debate about uh, these multiple histories uh, you know there was have there was one history and you had to learn it and too bad if you didn't like it <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. I don't think there is a uh, there is a problem with the publishing of the history. I think there is a problem about the leaning, which is also no, no, so defined. What is also, the problem with the other leaning? Let the other no leaning problem. also get no, no, also no. get an airing. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that as you said, that it does not. You know, uh, uh, to me, I'm sorry to use this word, but there is a little bit of that fear mongering about why can this not be published. I, I don't think the problem is about it being published. Yeah. The questions that are being asked are the same questions that you're also asking, yeah. which is that if the other side is, side is publishing it, what are the gatekeeping uh, aspects of it? How does the so fact aspect of so it? So I think remain? the and that is the question. So whether, the gatekeeping has to be about the facts. So, so the gatekeeping has to be about the facts. So, as I said, the uh, you have every historian and every person has a right to their own opinions. They do not have their right to their own facts. The histories that are now being presented, sadly, are wrong in their facts. Now, once you have corrected the facts, it is perfectly fine to uh, present multiple views. By the way, in my view, uh, uh, the fun part of history is actually to present the facts and say, "Okay, I think this is what happened. What do you think?" You, You'll see that in many of my books. I actually say this is what I think may have happened, uh, or this is an interpretation that I think or other things could also have happened. I I liberally say that in many of my books. In fact, which is the beauty of reading your book, mm -hmm. the fact that you are out there saying that this is what I have researched, and I leave it entirely up to you to uh, yeah. uh, to interpret, uh, which is a luxury that is not being afforded as far as some of the reading of the history is concerned. And uh, uh, we, okay, so the question that I want to ask is: Are we too quick right now? to put labels before understanding because the thing is yes so that is the thing you haven't seen any of the change textbooks you already put a label that this is going to be no, some who's great that label uh, well i don't know that certainly is the case certainly is the case by certain um, uh, uh, existing uh, uh, prima donnas of the established uh, narrative um, <laughs> uh, which are you know uh, uh, you know of course uh, i mean uh, let me name her uh, romila thapar 
uh, maybe 90 years old, but she wasn't exactly sitting around having uh, lunch with uh, any of these characters of history any more than I was. So, so she is very welcome to present her uh, facts, but her uh, the tone in which she uh, presents the facts is that I have, because I have gone through a certain uh, lineage of uh, so, thinking, etc., can to pronounce what history is. I'm sorry, uh, there are other people who can have a different view and let there be a debate. My problem is with the lack of debate, primarily. Of course. Um, and I think, therefore, the textbooks that we have, which have not been changed, sadly, I think need to be changed. Now, if they are changed in ways that you find is indefensible, I'll, I am with you. But it has not, I, I think the main problem is it's not been changed. So, I think we agree with two facts that there is definitely a... What? <laughs> Nobody has the guts to change it. <laughs> they will. Uh, the, so, so, let, so we are agreed on two facts. One, that there is definitely a need for debate. Yeah. And two, that the primacy of facts cannot ever be questioned. Absolutely. And if you put the facts down, this is the evidence. Now you debate. Uh, you know, a, a same set of event, uh, same data can be interpreted in different ways. And the further back in history you go. And by the way, history is not some static subject. Of course not. New evidence comes. From Malta, you may, uh, archaeology gets new evidence, genetics, all kinds of new evidence come. So, this uh, field should keep evolving. Sure. Uh, uh, even the very best minds, even if we agree on what it is, uh, we agree on what the history is today. Tomorrow, some new thing may come, uh, which sure. uh, disproves what, whatever I saw. It is an evolving field. Absolutely. At best, even if we all agree, it is our interpretation of facts, of the facts themselves. So, one is interpretation, the facts themselves evolve. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, for someone who wants to begin uh, writing about this, um, and since we are living in a world of social media, what would be the three to five points, the listicles that you would tell them to keep in mind when they start uh, their career as a writer? Um, difficult to say. I mean, I didn't start out being a writer. Mm -hmm. I am a largely a reluctant writer. I am actually an enthusiastic researcher who reluctantly writes down stuff because he feels that having researched it, he should do something about it with the material. Sure. So, I am not the person, I have a day job where I also have to do a lot of writing. So, um, but if so somebody wants to be a writer, here is, take it with many pinches of salt. I think first thing to do is to delineate, and here I am talking non-fiction, fiction is a different universe. Uh, delineate, what is it that you want to uh, research? Because you see, everything is connected to something else. And there is a danger of inexperienced writers to go out there and try and write everything under the sun. Now, this is coming from somebody who writes very big picture histories. Sure. Um, even I have to then fix uh, the uh, contours of what I am going to uh, um, uh, write. So, that is the first thing. What is the contours of what you will write, number one. Uh, secondly, I think, and others may do it differently, uh, one is just read stuff along the way without having any particular uh, agenda or writing to start with. Right. Um, because I think um, if you start with, I have to write this chapter, I mean, it's of course uh, all good for me to say I don't have to earn my living doing this. But if you have that luxury, then, then um, uh, don't start with the idea that I have to write something with it. Just let the research itself flow in, in, a, in, a, in a way. At some point, a structure of the story will appear to you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sounding all very mystical, but uh, that is essentially, at some point, the story sounds hard enough and the linkages in the story sound clear enough that you can attempt to write. So, there are people who write and then sort of uh, muddle along till the sure. end. Sure. Uh, I'm not one of them. Uh, when I begin to type, I basically have a fairly good idea how it ended. Uh, do remember, I'm non this is non-fiction, so, you Absolutely. know, you know what happened. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in 1947, India became free. Sure. So, whatever I may start on, on, on the story is known. Sure. And, and so, I already have in my head, uh, by the time I write, begin writing, I have already done enough of the research. Now, of course, along the way, I enhance it, I find new information, etc. Sure. But basically, by the time I'm writing, I know what I'm going to say. Absolutely. Remember that, if you want to start uh, um, your uh, writing career, that's uh, 
from someone who's written a wonderful, wonderful book uh, called uh, <laughs> The Seven Rivers, uh, The History of India's Geography. It's absolutely phenomenal to have had this conversation. Uh, enlightening as well, because there's always uh, perspectives that we tend to miss out on, which, uh, which need to be underlined. So uh, for your time and uh, for your generosity, we'd like to thank you very much, Sanjeev. Sanjeev. Thank you. This is the Teamwork Arts Podcast. If you liked it, remember to follow us on social media. It will be really, really nice. And uh, yeah, um, think. That's important. And uh, as we've said, the importance of debate and the primacy of facts. You might want to write that down somewhere. Thank you for watching the Teamwork Arts Podcast. If you've enjoyed this podcast, subscribe to our channel now. We have a new episode out every Friday.